Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right, I wouldn't know if you couldn't because I don't see the chat screen anymore. So, uh, my topic for today was on the evaluation of crawler architectures on clear net, social, and dark net websites. Um, so, the article itself was called A Crawler Architecture for Harvesting the Clear, Social, and Dark Web for um, Internet of Things Related Cyber Threat Intelligence. These are, it was, the research was done in Greece. These are all the lovely people whose names I'm not going to try to butcher right now. But this is, uh, if you need to look this up at all, you can find these authors. So a little bit of background because I, I know that a lot of people may not be aware of the different levels of the internet, at least at a high level. So very quick descriptions, the clear net is whatever can be indexed by search engines. If you can Google it or Bing it or whatever other search engines people use now, it can technically be called the clear net. The deep web is an area of the internet that's not indexed, which means you can't specifically search for it on Google or some other search engine. It may be behind a paywall, it might be a gaming service, it could be a forum, something like that. In this presentation, the uh, writers of the article actually call this the social net but technically they're talking about the deep web. The dark net is access through special programs or proxies such as Tor. There are a few others, but Tor is the one that is most active and most utilized. More background. There's a, what is web crawling? We're gonna talk about it throughout this presentation, so I figured we'll dip our toes in. A program or automated script which moves through the internet in a directed manner. All this means is that a, it's going to start on whatever URL, whatever website you give it, and it's going to move with some path that it is designed for. Um, legitimate tools use this, such as search engines, researchers use it, and so on. Web crawlers can create copies of visited pages or pull data specifically into a crawler inquiry. Some crawlers may be used to check the validity or active status of links and web pages for coding. Specifically, this is used a lot for the dark net. Um, and then, as with anything, web crawlers can be used for good or benign tasks like search engines or negative or malicious tasks like email address scraping. The article goes over a few different types of crawlers. So just for awareness, I wanted to go over them briefly here too. A centralized crawler is basically if I'm on my computer and I decide I want to go find all of the best movies on one of the movie rating sites like Rotten Tomatoes, I could create a crawler that goes onto that website and brings back all the data and hosts it on my machine. That would be a centralized crawler. A parallel or distributed crawler is going to be active on multiple machines and or it will actually be working in parallel, rather than just being hosted on multiple machines, multiple crawlers may be going out, and then they have to be able to exchange information to not get all twisted. A hybrid is using the central control of a centralized crawler, but is scalable for the distributed model. Uh, the centralized component ends up being a bottleneck in these systems usually. For peer-to-peer, uh, it's usually lightweight. Multiple systems will be hosting data or storing data. Um, as it's described in the article, it's systems on the far ends or far, far edges of the internet. I don't necessarily agree with that description because I don't necessarily agree that the internet has edges, but still, it's a large scale collaboration. And then cloud-based, is where you are using the infrastructure in the cloud uh, to map or reduce uh, to map out whatever websites you're looking for or whatever you're trying to uh, crawl, and you can actually store things in some type of database. This is, as mentioned here, designed to be a data as a service concept. Oops. So the actual architecture of the project at hand is shown here. There are two major components, the crawling module and the content ranking, uh, ranking module. 
The above architecture was designed and developed using open source software, including an open source focus crawler, implementation of word embeddings, and a NoSQL database. All front end uh, modules are based on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The crawler they use is actually pretty much all made in JavaScript. Going forward, um, machine learning techniques were used to direct the crawler towards relevant websites. The team used advanced language models to decide usefulness of websites and rank the content scraped. Language models used were not specified. Um, the latent topic models were used to take uh, background knowledge and design a vocabulary and relevant terms collection. And the crawler that was used is the ACHE crawler. This is the one that's built primarily in uh, JavaScript. You can actually find it here at the link that I've provided. It's a focused crawler for the clear web, an in-depth crawler for the social or deep web. And then there's also a darknet crawler component for Tor. All data downloaded during crawling is in a raw HTML format and stored in a NoSQL service called MongoDB. So the clear net architecture. This part was designed to perform focus crawls on the clear net to discover new resources specifically to this article regarding cyber threat intelligence for, uh, for Internet of Things devices. The model builder component of AC HE is trained using an SVM classifier and an equal number of positive and negative samples. The seed finder, which they describe in a previous article, so I'm not going to go too much into it, is a component utilized to identify seeds for focus crawl on the clear web by combining classification models and a user provided query relevant to the topic. For the deep web architecture, or in their case, the social web architecture, um, focus specification was on forums, which were specifically uh, aligned with cyber threat intelligence, Internet of Things devices. It was focused in on this topic at hand. Forum structure traversed while all relevant discussions on the topic were downloaded by the crawler. All links are considered relevant by default. For the clear net, they're not. Uh, the clear net would actually have to be able to identify, that spider had to be able to identify if the links were uh, considered relevant or not, whereas for the deep and the dark net, all of them are considered relevant. No page classification model was necessary. A re uh, I was regex based link filter used to filter out parts of forms which were irrelevant, such as user pages in specific forms or in cross forum fashion. Uh, this is an example of what those filter, uh, the filter syntax looks like. I can go into depth into what that says if anybody wants me to at the end. Um, and then this type of web crawling is primarily used for thread and forum monitoring and is not targeted to identifying new websites. Now for the darknet. Focused on Tor darknet websites, there is the web crawler is designed to interact with Tor proxies. Providing a number of .onion, which are Tor domain links assumed uh, viable, leading to hacker forums or marketplaces selling cybercrime tools, then monitors the dis discussions for relevant content. Darknet web crawlers require, sorry about that, require manual login abilities to overcome authentication mechanisms. Post initial success session cookies were then stored and utilized in future visits, um, such as for the HTTP requests. Crawled HTML pages were parsed by the content parser, subcomponent of the model, which extracts text-based content and metadata. So getting, moving on to the content ranking and classification, a novel ranking module to access the relevance and usefulness of the crawled content was created. Topic representation by vocabulary uh, distributed by utilizing vectors of related words. In an un or semi supervised training of latent topic models over the external data sets, led to salient phrases being identified. Uh, this allowed for somatic dependencies and statistical correlation among words to be identified and represented in low dimensional latent space by state of the art latent topic models. So, I, we haven't done too much uh, with 
like word to vec or other models uh, regarding natural language processing. But what they were doing here is they were taking words that appeared relevant to them, such as the Myra botnet or the Internet of Things or IoT, and they were trying to find words or phrases that correlated to those. Uh, they did not specify if they had a corpus or if they were just pulling all of the text off of the websites and then creating this. So for pre-processing of the data, all input data was put into an XML format and an XML DOM parser was used to parse the data, removing content other than user posts, comments, and tags. So usernames, uh, if there's a ranking system or a rating system, any blurbs, stuff like that. Parse data fed into the normalizer component, uh, which did case folding symbol remover, removal. So if somebody was writing in all caps, that was moved to lowercase. If somebody was writing grammatically correct, uh, still everything moved to lowercase. Question marks, commas, those items may have been removed. And everything was uh, made anonymous so that all user data was taken out, uh, usernames, email addresses, stuff like that. Finally, a multi-word expression tokenization was done, which included identification and characterization of important multi-word terms, similar to what I mentioned before about like Mira, Botnet, or Internet of Things. Then we move on to the model trainer. Pre-processed data is then used to train the language model using Gensim, an open source implementation of word to vec um, A latent space of 150 dimensions, a training window of five words, and a minimum occurrence of one term instance with 10 parallel threads were used. This resulted in a 150 dimensional distributional vector for each term, which occurs at least once in the training corpus. Topic vocabulary creator. Extracted user tags were augmented with a set of n most related terms in the latent space for each tag. n here equaled 5, 10, or 15. How related the terms and tags were is provided, uh, provided by the trained language models and corresponding word vectors. Resulting vocabulary was then stored in a separate NoSQL document on MongoDB. Then we move on to the content ranking itself, which is primarily, again, used with the clear net crawler. Relevant and usefulness in the crawled content is done using the expanded vocabulary to decide how similar a crawled page is to the topic being evaluated. To do this, the topic vector T is the sum of the distributional vectors of all topic terms TI, which exists in the topic vocabulary. And this is, that's what this equation is saying. The post vector P is constructed as the sum of the distributional vectors of all post terms, which is W, J, which are presented in the topic vocabulary T. For the topic T, the post containing a set of words is computed as this equation. So mostly what this is saying is that P is a new vector where we are looking at all of the words from a post that was taken off from an article taken off the website that the uh, ClearNet crawler looked at. And we are comparing that to the words that were posted with the vocabulary that we have already developed for the topic at hand, T. And this is the equation for computing that. And then finally, the relevance score is based on the topic T and the post P as computed as the cosine similarity of respective distributional vectors in the latent space. So it's comparing the two of them to come out with that relevance score. Preliminary evaluation. Focus crawl with modern, with model consisting of seven positive and seven negative URLs. 21 seeds were extracted by the seed finder regarding IoT vulnerabilities. 22,000 websites were done, uh, per hour per thread were harvested with 10% of frontier links uh, considered relevant according to the model and subsequently harvested. Web-based evaluation tools developed a collected crowdsourced data from human experts regarding relevance of data collected. 
assessed relevance was done on a four point scale by those human evaluators. Under approximately 1% of harvested websites contained actionable cyber threat intelligence on the clear web. Higher percentages for social or deep web and dark web, but the percentages were not indicated in the article. The visual component added to the computation of relevant scores and posts, which highlighted vocabulary words on actual crawled pages and displays computed relevance score uh, based on the model was added to this process afterwards. I don't have the image of it right now. It is kind of cool though. They were able to make it actually highlight the words that appeared relevant based on the training model. Now we get back to the spoiler page. Uh, this publication ended with just a preliminary evaluation. Uh, I don't know what the current overall results are, but I do believe that this is a relatively recent article. So I'm hoping that they will publish full results later on. Um, ACHE is a focus crawler. I was curious if the researchers tested out any different methods to find if another crawler architecture worked for this project. And if there was an equivalent of ACHE written in Python, because this one is written primarily in JavaScript. There is not a clear breakdown to which evaluation produced better results, clear, deep, or dark net, partially because we don't have the percentages for the deep or dark net, but also because I don't believe they, based on my understanding of the article, they were reading or reviewing the same types of web pages. Uh, as specified, they were not trying to find new websites. They were only reviewing art, uh, forums or marketplaces, depending on if it's deep or dark web. Whereas for the ClearNet, they were trying to actively find new websites. The types of sites they went to on the ClearNet probably differed for the dark or the deep net. And because of that, I don't know if it's equivalent to say that they found more um, appropriate or focused data since they would have already known the deep or dark net was focused compared to the clear net. So I don't know if those are equivalent. Any questions? Excellent presentation, Sai. Thank you so very much. And I really like these thoughts and comments. It actually looks a lot like your research plan. You're working on a similar project for your master's. Yes, I'm going to make the Python ACHE. Um, or <laughs> hopefully an improved version of this. Yes. Now, I do have a couple of seed questions for discussion, but before I begin, does anybody have any, anything to share with the class, including questions? I'll clarify anything anybody has questions on, if I can. Okay. So, um, Sai, does a paper provide any uh, metrics or evaluation results for uh, relevance detection or the machine learning models they train to detect whether something is relevant or not? I do not believe so. Um, let me just pull the article out to verify, but when I went through it again yesterday, I did not find anything like that. My, what I believe, here he is. They, other than in the section that I showed for content ranking, there wasn't any actual um, breakdown of the data itself. They gave examples of um, like the top ranked terms, but not how they got to those rankings. Interesting. Um, can you share some of those examples with us? Sure. Um, so the most relevant terms, uh, which were connected to DDoS, for example, number one was uh, DOS, two was volumetric, three was flooding, four was Cloudflare, five was proletic, six was flood, seven, Aldos, eight was floods with an S, nine was IP spoofing, uh, 10 was radware. Interesting. So what if the what if there's a forum post on a recent flood, natural flood? What do you think the what do you think the system would do with that information? It probably would have been uh, identified as relevant if it was only looking at that one item. Um, based on 
the rel the content ranking if it let's say t for the vector for the topic vector only had the word ddos in it if the only words on that page had to do with floods themselves um i would say that it it would have a higher chance of being considered relevant but because floods see, seeing as flood shows up in three different formats but it may not have a high enough ranking. I don't know at what point the ranking was cut off to say if it was relevant or not either. Right. That's interesting. That's definitely something that you as someone who's working in this field would, would want to look further yeah. into. Yes. Another, uh, another doubt that I have or a question that I have is, um, about the way they detect or count the uh, the number of harvested websites that contain actionable cyber threat intelligence. Mm -hmm. If you go to your preliminary evaluation slide. So they mentioned that uh, about 1% of harvested websites contain actionable CTI or cyber threat intelligence. How did they come up with this number? Do they, do they talk about it in the paper? I'm sorry, could you repeat which part you're talking about? The uh, one to the last point, 1% 1 of harvested websites contained actionable CTI. That was from the human evaluation. So they actually had a human expert that sat down and looked at all the data and decided whether the data is relevant to CTI or not, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So this is, this is a huge bottleneck. The amount of data that this project has collected is really, really large. And having to pay multiple CTI experts or cybersecurity experts to sit down and go through this data is often infeasible for smaller organizations. But still, this project is helping with the collection and curation part of cyber threat intelligence. And it's already helping with the reduction of effort and cost related to cyber threat intelligence. Um, let me see if I have any other questions. In the meantime, uh, class, if you have anything to add, uh, you're more than welcome to. Uh, Nancy, look, yeah, Nancy looks like uh, posted something in the chat. If you could just uh, clarify what your question is, either in the chat or voice, please. Nancy? Ah, that's an interesting insight. So Nancy is asking about the way their model captures the sentiment and the context of a particular conversation from the text and whether they are considering TF-IDF uh, for topic modeling. Sai, any thoughts on that? Based on my understanding at the preliminary point where we're at, I do not believe they're doing anything like that. I think they're really just connecting, here's a vector of what we have of words related to our topic. Here's the score that it gets for that web page. And so this is whether or not it might be relevant. I don't believe they're doing anything regarding the sentiment behind the posting. But well, that's a very interesting suggestion, Nancy. As you will see, uh, my research group, uh, where Sai and Shri are the part are part of, is active in working on cyber threat intelligence collection and analysis. Maybe, maybe you guys, Sai and Shri, would like to look more into TF-IDF. I know Shri has already started doing that so using TF-IDF to uh, do topic modeling and looking at the sentiment of uh, the pieces of text. So Lisha is asking what we mean by a sentiment. Uh, here it can mean whether the text is angry, happy, 
neutral, sad, or excited and such, and use this information to provide a better assessment of its relevance, its relevance to CTI. Interesting thoughts. Yes, thanks, Nancy. All right. Um, Sai, did, does the paper mention any, any challenges or mm -hmm. issues they faced in data collection and crawling? Not specifically with those items. Mostly they talked about how um, they did discuss how it's a bottleneck to be running these systems off of one machine. Uh, they also discussed the bottleneck that you mentioned of having a human expert evaluate those uh, websites that the, ten, the approximate 10 percent of frontier links that were considered relevant, having those then reviewed by a, an expert in the field only to end up with approximately 1 percent of clear net websites and then unknown percentages of the other websites. Okay. Uh, otherwise, Did you mention anything about uh, data that was available but their crawler did not collect or failed to collect? No, they didn't talk about that either that I recall. What I remember, what they talked about mostly was just pulling web pages, just HTML and text, um, and then evaluating that. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So this is a major challenge in automatic collection and analysis of cyber threat intelligence. There is, uh, it's very difficult to figure out whether our system is missing out on data or not. Mm -hmm. It's definitely adding some value to the process. It's collecting data automatically so that a human expert does not have to spend their time on doing so. But it's very difficult to measure the amount of data that the system has missed. And this is something that anyone working in cyber threat intelligence needs to be aware of. Very few are, but it's very important to note. Very well. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Oh, Lisha just pointed out to something really interesting. It's not just the problem, it's not just the data that have been missed, but also the data that may have been intentionally manipulated uh, to fool these automated crawlers and CTI collectors. That's a very good point. We actually uh, have an active research project along with our collaborators at Kansas State University that looks into adversarial attacks on machine learning models used to detect relevance uh, for these cr crawlers. And it turns out it's actually really, really easy to fool these models and consequently stay to hidden, uh, and consequently to hidden, to stay hidden from these crawlers. That was an, that's, an, that's a very interesting point. Thank you, Alicia. That was one of the comments too that I brought up when doing one of my other summaries for one of the other papers that also involved a human that had to kind of go through and analyze like the outliers and then feed that back to the model. By incorporating basically humans into the mix, you also bring in the fallibility of humans and human error. And so you can manipulate some of those outliers to be one result and end up sending that into the model. And then the model data ends up being skewed because you're basically falsely telling the model that something may be benign when it's actually malicious. Yes, yes, that's actually a very, very important issue in security data science in general. Our next course module, which should be released before the end of this week, is going to focus on adversarial machine learning, which is a field of uh, science that looks into uh, fooling machine learning, intentionally making machine learning models to make mistakes, and uh, ways to mitigate the impact of uh, these sort of attacks. But thank you very much for pointing this out, Lisha. Um, other thoughts, comments? Very well. Sai, once again, thank you so very much. 
This was an excellent presentation. Thank you. And I hope that if anybody has spare time and they want to look at something headache inducing, that they look at uh, the loveliness that is regex. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. Thanks. Bye.